This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. A Viking's Arabic Ring In the late 19th century, excavators of a former Viking trading center in the town of Birka, Sweden, discovered a highly unusual and seemingly out of place engraved ring buried in the grave of a 9th century woman. The ring itself was originally cataloged as being made of gilded silver and violet amethyst and bears the inscription for Allah in the Arabic Kufic language. For many years, little was known about the material and meaning behind the ring. While travel between the Islamic Caliphate and the Viking world was recorded in ancient texts, the tales of these journeys were often unbelievable as they included fantastical references to giants and dragons, and archaeological evidence supporting the accounts was rare. In 2015, researchers led by Stockholm University biophysicist Sebastian Vermlander used scanning electron microscopy with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy to analyze the ring's composition, and found that it was made of silver alloy, and the amethyst was simply colored glass. Although colored glass is seen as fake or of low quality by today's standards, this was not necessarily true in the past. Researchers said that even though glass production began around 5,000 years ago, it was still an exotic material in Viking Age Scandinavia. Scandinavians would have traded for fancy glass objects from Egypt and Mesopotamia as early as 3,400 years ago. More significantly, the researchers found no trace of the gold that had been assumed to coat the ring, along with significant filing marks. The file marks showed that there had not been much wear to the ring, and the team concluded that the ring must have been passed directly from an Arabic silversmith to the buried woman. The owner of the ring was found wearing traditional Scandinavian clothing, but researchers couldn't determine her ethnicity due to the decomposed state of the bones in the grave. The Burka Ring appears to corroborate the ancient tales about direct contact between Viking Age Scandinavia and the Islamic world, but the exact circumstances of the ring's journey remain unknown. During the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, English legend tells of a single, crazed, axe-wielding Viking who held an entire army at bay, maintaining a position in the middle of a bridge until he was speared from beneath by an English soldier floating down the river. Tales like this helped the Vikings become known as fearsome warriors who relish their reputation as bloodthirsty invaders. But is it all true? What can archaeological artifacts like the Burka Ring tell us about how people of the past truly lived? Thanks to Magellan TV, you can now learn more about the Vikings and other past civilizations in the award-winning documentary series Time Team. Dark 5 viewers can take advantage of a special offer and free trial from Magellan TV to watch Time Team and hundreds of other programs exploring history's greatest mysteries. Visit try.magellantv.com slash dark5 or click on the link in the description below to begin streaming now. A hidden treasure in the streaming world, Magellan TV has the best and largest collection of history shows anywhere, with over 20 hours of new content added weekly. It's also the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. Support Dark 5 and visit try.magellantv.com slash dark5 today to start your free trial. Piri Reis Map In 1929, archaeological director Halil Edom combed through the basement of Topkapi Palace in Turkey, looking for old maps at the request of German theologian Gustav Adolf Deismann. Deismann had been commissioned by the Turkish Ministry of Education to catalog the palace's non-Islamic items, and while Edom was looking, he serendipitously discovered a mysterious artifact. He found a gazelle skin parchment with a small map inked on it, although only a fraction of it remained. It was ultimately named the Piri Reis map, and was found to be drawn from 20 different sources by Ottoman Turkish cartographer Ahmed Muhyiddin Piri in 1513. Most notably, it was claimed that one of the map's original sources was a lost, hand-drawn map created by Christopher Columbus and left to Piri by his uncle, who had personally sailed with the explorer. 
Not only did the Piri Reefs map include unusually accurate annotations and depictions of the Azores, Canary Islands, Atlantic Islands, and Japan, but Dysman was amazed to find it included what seemed to be a depiction of Antarctica centuries before it was officially discovered in 1773. The mystery deepened further when researchers looked at Antarctica's coastline, which displayed the continent without its ice cap, something that would have only been visible over 6,000 years ago. In 1965, University of New Hampshire professor Charles Hapgood scrutinized the map with several of his students and found another strange map feature. The map itself had been created using the Mercator projection, a technique that allowed for more accurate curvature when moving maps from paper to globe. This technique was not used by European cartographers until 1569, 56 years after Rees. Hapgood concluded that the Piri Rees map was based on information older than 4000 BCE, theorizing that perhaps it had come from an ancient civilization that had the skills to navigate the world's oceans. However, critics of Hapgood's theories have pointed out that the Antarctica portion of the map bore similarities to that of the South American coastline, also noting that Reese's own description to the region called it very hot and full of snakes. The debate regarding the map's origins continues to this day. Is it proof of an advanced ancient seafaring civilization, or does it simply represent a case of mistaken geographic identity? Wolfbert Swords When we think of the Middle Ages, it's difficult to detach the period from images of bloody battlefield conflicts, and in medieval times, the weapon of choice would have been a sword. And one variety of sword stands out from the rest, baffling archaeologists due to its strength and superior construction, the legendary Ulfbert sword. Largely associated with Vikings, only 170 examples of Ulfbert swords have been found, each dated between 800 and 1000 AD. One feature of the Ulfbert that has confounded archaeologists is the metal they were made from. The distribution of carbon in the blade was perfect, and the crafted blades were far sharper and more durable than any others created at the time. Archaeologists did not believe that the technology to create such metal was invented until 800 years later, during the Industrial Revolution. Each sword was made in the traditional Viking style, with a long double-edged blade and a straight crossbar over the grip, all stamped with the distinctive Ulfbert name on the blade. It was the sword of choice for noble Vikings, super strong and almost unbeatable in battle. With ordinary swords being an expensive weapon of choice at the time, the Ulfbert were the best, most expensive, and probably the most prized possessions of elite Vikings. Little is known about who made the Ulfbert swords, but it is thought that the maker originated from the Kingdom of Francis, modern-day France and Germany, due to Ulfbert being a Frankish personal name. Alan Williams of the Wallace Collection in London studied the blades and believed the maker was unique. Quote, it's much like putting the Apple name on a computer, he said. Since the swords continued to be made for about 200 years, this Ulfbert certainly wasn't the only blacksmith creating them. And with so many imitation swords out there, figuring out who created the original mythical Ulfbert swords will likely long remain a mystery. Akashic Kalishlawaka Head The Takashik Kalishlawaka Roman head was discovered by Jose Garcia Payon in 1933 while excavating a burial site within the Matlatzinka city of Tekashik in Colombia. The Roman bust was found amongst an abundance of other artifacts, including gold, turquoise, crystal, and pottery. It was buried three floors beneath a sacred pyramidal structure and appeared undisturbed dating between 1476 and 1510 AD. These dates mean the bust had been there before the Spanish conquest of Mexico in 1519, begging the question of how it could have possibly got there. In 1995, the head was sent to Germany for scientific thermoluminescence testing that determined a production date 
between 184 BC and 618 AD. Dating was further narrowed down to specifically the 2nd century AD by Bernard André of the German Institute of Archaeology in Rome, who said, quote, The head is without any doubt Roman, and the lab analysis has confirmed that it is ancient. The stylistic examination tells us more precisely that it is a Roman work from around the 2nd century AD, and the hairstyle and the shape of the beard present the typical traits of the Severian Emperor's period, 193 to 235 AD, exactly in the fashion of the epoch. Assuming that the head is authentic, there are a few different theories on how it found its way into the grave. The first theory is that it was a hoax. According to an informal declaration by Paul Schmidt, an archaeologist at UNAM, the head was planted in the site by a participating archaeologist, Hugo Moedano, attempting to play a practical joke on Garcia Payon. Garcia Payon's son insists that his father was there at the time of discovery, and nobody present during the excavation is alive to verify or deny the controversy, leaving it as hearsay. Another theory looks at the neighboring islands of the Caribbean, which had been colonized since the late 15th century. Although the conquistadors had not made it to the Mexican mainland until 1519, these islands, as well as mainland coastal regions of Honduras to Panama, had been colonized. It is possible that the peace had been brought from Europe and traded with the indigenous people, eventually making its way down to Kalish Lawaka. The final theory looks a lot closer to home, and suggests that although the bust bears the resemblance to a 3rd century Roman emperor, there's plenty of Mesoamerican artwork that features European or Persian-looking bearded men. To date, there has not been any conclusive evidence of whether the head of Kalish Lawaka is a Roman creation or the imaginative work of a Mesoamerican artist. Kensington Runestone In the late 19th century, Swedish immigrant Olaf Oman said that he found a slab of gray wax stone covered in runes in central Minnesota. He reported that he unearthed the stone from a field in the largely rural township of Solom when he was clearing land before plowing. It was named after the nearest settlement, Kensington. The Kensington runestone was purportedly found during a time of renewed interest in the Vikings, stirred by the romantic nationalist movement and popular tales of Leif Erikson's journey to North America. Political friction between Norway and Sweden at the time resulted in some Norwegians claiming the stone was a Swedish hoax, and more than coincidental that the stone was found among Scandinavian newcomers in Minnesota. After being translated, the inscription on the Kensington runestone appears to be a record left behind by Scandinavian explorers in the 14th century, and the date inscribed onto the runestone is 1362. It reads, quote, We are eight Goths, Swedes, and 22 Norwegians on an exploration journey from Vinland through the west. We had camp by a lake with two skerries, small rocky islands, one day's journey north from this stone. We were out and fished one day. After we came home, we found ten of our men red with blood and dead. AVM, Ave Virgo Maria, or Hail Virgin Mary, save us from evil. We have ten of our party by the sea to look after our ships, fourteen days' journey from this island, year 1362. A copy of the inscription was sent to the University of Minnesota, where it was declared to be a forgery. Further copies were sent on to linguists and historians in Scandinavia, who, quote, unanimously pronounced the Kensington inscription a fraud and forgery of recent date. The writing and language of the text are questionable. Experts first analyzed the runic writing in 1899. They dismissed it as a fake, citing too many discrepancies in form and vocabulary from the known language of 14th century Scandinavia. Most experts since then have agreed. So who was responsible for the alleged hoax? The most obvious answer is Olaf Omen. Although he had little education, Omen owned a small library that included information about runes. He was also reported to have a dislike of academics, so he may have enjoyed trying to fool them. Definitive answers have so far proved beyond reach. Thank you for watching Dark Five. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond. Your support and engagement help my videos get seen by even more people. And let me know if there are any other ancient mysteries you would like me to investigate.